webinars are made possible thanks to generous donor support. If you'd like to contribute, please visit our website, autism.org. to welcome everyone worldwide to today's webinar titled Behavioral Strategies to Treat Anxiety in Individuals with Autism, presented by Dr. Lauren Moskowitz. Uh, this webinar is co-sponsored by the Autism Research Institute in San Diego, California, and the World Autism Organization. My name is Dr. Steve Edelson, and I'm the director <clears throat> of the Autism Research Institute, or ARI. First, I'd like to introduce Petra Dillman, who is the president-elect of the World Autism Organization. And she will share information about the World Autism Organization. So Petra. Hello, everybody. Thank you for having me here. I'm a parent of a 32-year-old young man with autism. And I've been a member of the World Autism Organization since about 2000 or 2001. But I know the ARI organization for much longer because I subscribe to the ARI newsletter for very long. The World Autism Organization sprouted actually from the Autism Europe Organization because it was found that there was much more work to be done around the world than what the Autism Europe um, Association could handle. And its first president was Pat Matthews. It was formed in 1998 in November. And since then, on a four year term, we've had um, Paul Shattuck as president and Isabel Bayonas. Our presidents revolve into other countries. So sometimes a bit difficult to keep everything together and, but that also gives, a, um, it gives an opportunity to bring in different ideas and bring in new people. And currently, Dr. Samira Alsat from Kuwait is the president. And with me as president elect, we will try and do our best to improve the services for people with autism around the world. We are not so much a financial giving organization than one to, uh, to share the resources. So if we can share ideas and give assistance, that's what we're about and that's what we'd like to do. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Petra. Uh, let me now say a few words about the Autism Research Institute. Um, pioneering researcher and advocate, Dr. Bernard Remlin, uh, founded ARI in 1967. Uh, we're the oldest research organization on autism in the world. And as many of you know, Dr. Remlin is responsible for changing the field from viewing autism as caused by bad parenting uh, to a biological condition. Um, ARI funds research studies, uh, sponsors an international support group network, as well as a science network, uh, sponsors think tank meetings, both nationally and regionally, uh, publishes original articles and books, uh, produces videos and webinars, and we actually do a lot more as well. So, and you can learn more about what we do at www.autism.org. As for, for today's speaker, um, I have great respect for Dr. Lauren Moskowitz. Uh, she is one of the few behaviorists who studies anxiety and autism, and she has contributed in many ways to our efforts at the Autism Research Institute. So I really appreciate her helping us out today. Um, Denise Fulton, ARI's Managing Director of Administration and Programs, uh, will formally introduce Dr. Moskowitz. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Good morning, everybody. Just so everyone on the webinar knows, this webinar will be recorded and playback will be online later this week at autismwebinars.org. 
No continuing education credits are offered for this particular talk, but free certificates of participation are available upon successful completion of a brief knowledge quiz after the talk concludes. The link will be on the playback page, which was included in your reminder email, and we will also provide an alternative link on that page if you have any trouble accessing the quiz. Now, before we get started, I'll introduce our speaker. Lauren Moskowitz is an Associate Professor of Psychology at St. John's University and a core member of the School Psychology Programs. She's on the editorial board of the Journal of Positive Behavioral Interventions and serves as a peer reviewer for many other leading journals in the field. She also sits on ARI's Scientific Advisory Board. And now I'll turn it over to Dr. Moskowitz. Thanks, Denise. All right, well, today I'm gonna to talk about behavioral strategies to treat anxiety in individuals on the autism spectrum. And I'll try to present, um, there's a much longer 1.5 hour version of this talk online you can access. So I'm gonna to try to give a brief snapshot of that for about half an hour so that it could reserve the last half an hour for um, questions, okay? All righty. So before I get started, I just wanna give a background on what anxiety is. Um, just so we can make sure we're all on the same page with what anxiety is. Anxiety is a multi-component construct that's made up of thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. So the thoughts are, you know, the thoughts you might have when you're afraid, like, oh, that spider is going to bite me, or, uh, you know, oh, I'm going to fail that test and then I'll never get into college, or, oh, if I talk to that person, he might laugh at me. You know, all the anxious or worry thoughts we might have when we're anxious or afraid. The feelings consist of the feelings of physiological arousal that you might feel when you're anxious or afraid, which is, you know, different for every person, but it's often your heart pounding or racing, feeling lightheaded or dizzy, um, butterflies in your stomach, perhaps a tingling, uh, trembling. Um, you know, those are some of the major physical feelings that might be associated with anxiety. And then of course, there's the behaviors that are associated with anxiety, the behavioral component, which could, depending on the person, again, consist of running under the table, running away, cowering, freezing, uh, you know, crying, etc. So all of those make up the, the, the construct of anxiety and they're all related. And so what makes that a little challenging to identify in autism sometimes, is that, you know, with a neurotypical person, anxiety is typically assessed by self-report by asking the person, are you afraid? Are you anxious? And individuals on the spectrum often have trouble expressing their thoughts and feelings. You know, at least a third of individuals are nonverbal or minimally verbal. And those who are verbal do often have trouble um, expressing, yeah, their thoughts and feelings, right? So that can make it very difficult. And so then often we have to rely on the behaviors alone to judge anxiety which can be hard because an individual can cry or self-injure or be aggressive, et cetera, because they're anxious, but they can also cry or hit or self-injure or scream for a variety of other reasons. They're in pain or they're ill or they're frustrated or they're angry or they don't like something, et cetera. You know, the reasons are very um, diverse, right? So identifying anxiety can be challenging in this population, which is why it's often overlooked. Um, I could do a whole separate talk on assessment, but I'll, I'll pause it there uh, just because I do want to get to how do we treat it once we do identify it. But I wanted to make sure we're on the same page with what anxiety actually is. And we do know, even though it's you know very much underdiagnosed in this population, overlooked, we do know that anxiety is much more common in individuals with autism than in neurotypical individuals and in individuals with other developmental disabilities. So I'll start by saying that. So in terms of how we treat anxiety, there's many different treatment components we use. And the treatment components are basically the same whether you have autism or not. So I'm going to first go over these treatment components that we would use across the board, whether the individual has autism or does not. But then I will discuss how we modify it, how we modify these components for individuals on the spectrum. Okay. So the first thing in terms of treating anxiety that we do in what's called cognitive behavioral therapy, is we often start out with what's called psychoeducation, which is just a fancy jargony psychology word for education, just educating people about what anxiety is. Um, we do this for children or adults with autism. Um, sometimes they may not be able to understand the psychoeducation component of it, so at least we will try to convey this information to parents or teachers or other relevant stakeholders. 
And this is important because for, for a variety of reasons, in part, it could change your attributions as a parent or teacher, right? So you so you don't just think, oh, this kid's hitting or punching me because they're being non-compliant, but it might make you, you know, reconceptualize their behavior as, oh, this kid's anxious. They're acting like this because they're anxious, right? So it can help to realize that behaviors are due to anxiety, right? But so part of psychoeducation is we define anxiety like I just did on the previous slide. We normalize anxiety for kids and their parents. We say, you know what? Everyone's anxious sometimes, everyone, right? If we didn't have any anxiety, we wouldn't be motivated to even study for a test or show up to work on time, or I wouldn't have prepared at all for this presentation, right? So some anxiety is helpful. It's evolutionary adaptive. We were wired to have anxiety, right? Um, and that leads to the next point, anxiety as a function or purpose. We were evolutionarily designed to have anxiety. You know, if we see a lion or um, in the wild, we want our fight or flight system to be activated, our heart to be pounding and pump blood to our feet and our extremities so that we can run fast from that lion and get away, right? So there's a reason we have anxiety. Uh, it keeps us motivated, right? But of course, sometimes we have too much anxiety. And that's, that was, that's when it can become a problem, when anxiety is so great that it's difficult to function, right? That's when we would treat it. And sometimes, you know, our anxiety occurs in the correct circumstances, right? If you see a lion or a burglar, you know, you want yourself to feel fear or anxiety. You want to react, right? But we always explain to sick kids, sometimes it's like a fire alarm. You want the fire alarm to go off when there's a real fire. But unfortunately, a lot of the time the fire alarm goes off, maybe if there's just burnt toast, right? So that's what happens sometimes with our kids or, or adults, you know, with anxiety is that it's a faulty fire alarm, or maybe I shouldn't say faulty, but oversensitive fire alarm that's maybe going off for burnt toast, going off in situations in which we really shouldn't be anxious or afraid, right? Those are the kinds of situations that we're talking about treating. So we explain all this to individuals with autism. If again, if they are able to to un understand this information, or we explain and or we explain it to parents or teachers, right? The other piece of psychoeducation is externalizing anxiety, giving that anxiety a name. Um, sometimes we call it just anxiety or OCD. Um, if it's an older individual, um, if it's a kid, uh, we would probably externalize the anxiety and name it something that would be an enemy, right? So uh, my daughter right now is obsessed with Harry Potter. A lot of kids with autism I work with have also been obsessed with Harry Potter. So we might name the anxiety Voldemort. For those of you who are not Harry Potter fans, if, if you're obsessed with Star Wars, we might name it Darth Vader, right? So that we could externalize the anxiety as something we try to fight against. And we'll talk more about this. The reason for that is because you're trying as a parent or teacher to help the child realize that when you're doing things that might be hard for the child or helping the child to do things that might be difficult for them. We're not fighting against our child, but rather you are joining with your child to fight against Voldemort, to fight against Darth Vader, to fight against the anxiety. So it helps to externalize the anxiety and see it as something separate from yourself rather than as, uh, you know, this is just my brain miswiring and causing me to be afraid in these situations rather than blaming yourself or blaming the child per se, okay? Uh, we explain the three component model that I explained on the previous slide, and we explain the rationale for treatment, which I'm going to get to um, in, in two more slides. And the main component of treating anxiety is what we call exposure, which is what it sounds like, exposing yourself to what you're afraid of. Um, and you might think, well, hell, if I wanted to face my fears, I, you know, I would just do it, right? But it's not that easy, obviously. It's hard to face your fears, hard to face the things that make you anxious. So, um, that's why it often requires treatment and the help of a professional sometimes, or the, at least the help of your parents, teachers, other people in your life. Um, but so the, the notion, we're gonna explain exposure in a few slides, but you explain, um, part of psychoeducation is explaining the rationale now for treatment, that you learn that you can deal with it, that you learn that you know anxiety is just an uncomfortable feeling, fear is just an uncomfortable feeling, it's just my heart racing, and I can tolerate it. I can still live my life and do things, even, even with that uncomfortable feeling, okay? So um, that's the psychoeducation piece. Um, what we do um, with, with cognitively able individuals and with neurotypical individuals and with those individuals with autism who are more cognitively able is we do something called cognitive restructuring which is again, a fancy kind of jargony term for helping you change the way you're thinking. Remember, we explained that anxiety is made up of your thoughts, feelings, and behaviors, right? So we have to target each of those things, the thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. 
cognitive re restructuring is a way of trying to target those anxious thoughts and feelings. Um, by, you know, so I'm thinking of one girl with autism I worked with who was of scared of spiders, terrified of spiders. And we, she would think her worry thoughts were, you know, that spider's going to crawl on me, it's going to bite me, I'm going to die. So we would help her realize, you know, okay, do I know for certain the spider is going to crawl on me? Or if it does crawl on me, do I know for certain it would bite me? Or if it did bite me, what are the chances? What's the evidence that I would die? Um, you know, and then we also try to get kids to, to think, you know, and sometimes the worst thing will happen. Sometimes, um, you know, a spider will bite you for help, or maybe you will fail a test. But we try to get people to think, you know what, if the worst happens, I could probably cope with it, right? Um, and I might have given this example in another talk, but I think this is a good example of, of the way anxiety works. You often what's called catastrophize or snowball. I worked with an adolescent who was afraid that if she failed a test, she would fail out of her class. Then she would fail out of school. She wouldn't graduate high school. And then she would never get into a college. And so she really snowballed there, right? So we helped her realize that, okay, you know, would would you would you probably pass this test? Probably, right? Like, what's the likelihood you would fail this test? Have you studied for this test? Have you ever failed a test in the past? Okay, you've never failed a test in the past. You've studied hard for this test. So in all likelihood, you're probably going to pass the test. But, you know, again, we don't, with, with anxiety, we never want to get into the habit of reassurance because the reality is we never know what's going to happen in life. We don't know. There is uncertainty. And part of treating anxiety is helping individuals to deal with that uncertainty, right? So sometimes the worst thing might happen. Sometimes you might fail that test. Okay, so what if you did fail the test? In all likelihood, you probably wouldn't fail out of school. And we would talk about all those different scenarios. But again, even if the worst did happen, you did fail out of school. To think, okay, I will never get a job and be homeless for the rest of my life, probably not a realistic thought. How would you cope with that if you did fail out of school and you didn't go to college? And so with that individual, we looked at all the different jobs she could have without a college degree. And she was able to say, oh, you know what? I'd love to be a flight attendant, actually, you know, and um, so that was really helpful for her. So in general, we're trying to gear people towards thinking about, you know what? Probably these thoughts they have are unrealistic and the worst thing won't happen. But even if it did, how would I cope with that? Because the reality is, again, bad things do happen in life. And how can we live in the face of that? How can we cope with that so we can still live our life? to the best of our ability, right? Obviously what I'm talking about here is kind of cognitively advanced. So a lot of in, a lot of kids with or without autism and certainly a lot of individuals with autism, um, that is a, a lot of that is too cognitively complex. So with a lot of individuals, we just focus on basic kind of coping self-talk or boss back self-talk. Um, basically self-talk you can tell yourself to help you face your fears, to help you be brave, to help you cope with anxiety, to say, you know what, I've done this before, I can do it again. I've taken, the, the, the child was taught to say, you know, I've taken tests before, I've always done well, I will probably do well again. And if I don't, I will cope with it. I'll handle it, I'll be okay. You know, for other kids, they might say to themselves, you know, my anxiety will pass, I'm gonna get used to it. I'm gonna get used to this feeling. Other people might say, this is just my brain telling me I have to wash my hands or I have to run away from this dog. I'm not going to listen to it. That's just my anxiety or Voldemort telling me that I have to run away from this dog or run away from this spider or do whatever. That's just Voldemort telling me that I'm not going to listen to Voldemort. I'm going to be brave and I'm going to fight my fears, right? So that's what we mean by coping self-talk. And sometimes it's just something as simple as I can handle this. For some of the kids, it's, it's really just a really simple statement like I can do it or I can handle it, or I can be brave. Some coping statement you can teach them to say that can help them to face their fears, right? So that's the cognitive, the cognitive end of things, okay? All of that, the psychoeducation and the cognitive structuring is really in the service of the main treatment component, which is graduated exposure. This, I can't emphasize this enough, this is the most critical treatment component of treating anxiety. Often we'll, we, I would see kids come to the clinic who would say they'd had behavioral therapy or say they'd had CBT, but all they'd had was cognitive restructuring, a lot of talk about their anxiety, but no action, right? Uh, things aren't going to get better that way, right? You could talk about things to your blue in the face, but at the end of the day, there needs to be action, right? There needs to be behavior change. We need to teach people that they can face their fears and that they'll be okay, right? That they'll be okay. So... What graduated exposure means, just to be clear, it is not flooding, 
it does not mean that if you're afraid of a pool, you throw, you throw the person in the water. That is not what we mean, right? It means that we, if you're afraid of a pool, afraid of a swimming pool, we would help you when you're ready at your own pace to be able to dip your toe in. And when you feel comfortable with that, you know, dip your whole foot in. When you feel comfortable with that, maybe going up to your knee. And when you feel comfortable with that, going up to your waist and so on. To do things little by little, to face your fears little by little when you're ready. Again, we never want to thrust a feared situation on the person with autism. We want to help them to confront it on their own. You know, we people with um, autism, unfortunately, are often, there's often a loss of control and, and a lack of empowerment. People often really thrust things onto them that, that they don't want in a very unfair way that the rest of us would don't experience in our own lives. And that's not fair. So I, I, it's very important that um, we don't take control away from, from individuals on the spectrum, that the control is always within them, but that we help them to face their fears um, in gradual ways, right? And, you know, the, the old school way of thinking about it is that, there, you know, there's a process called habituation, right? When, if you were to tap me over and over and over, you know, again, I'd be really annoyed by that at first, for sure. But eventually I'd get used to that. I would get used to you tapping me and probably would have noticed that you're tapping me after an hour or two of you tapping me. But what that means is habituation. Humans, animals, we're wired for habituation, right? So the notion of exposure treatment was that if you expose people to the thing they're afraid of over and over and over and over again, eventually they get used to it, right? And that is the case most of the time. Um, that said, we do know individuals on the spectrum might take a lot longer to habituate different due to differences in physiological arousal. Um, and some neurotypical individuals might take longer to habituate. So more recent treatments have tried to refocus, uh, refocus from the habituation model. Okay, we're going to get used to it too. You know what? Maybe you won't get used to it right away. Maybe your anxiety won't come down right away. And that's okay. You, usually, again, when you're um, exposed to a fear feared situation for a while, you can't stay at that top anxiety level forever. Eventually your anxiety will come down. But that said, um, we try to focus people on, even if your anxiety doesn't come down, it's okay. You know, you can feel anxious and still live your life, right? You can feel anxious and still play a piano song at a recital. You can feel anxious and still go up to that person and say hello. You can feel anxious and still go pet that dog. We can still do things that make us anxious and live our lives because at the end of the day it's just an uncomfortable emotion and we can tolerate that uncomfortable emotion we can deal with it it's not going to kill us feeling anxiety it might feel unpleasant but again lots of things feel unpleasant much like you might feel very hot or cold and still might do something even if it made you feel a little uncomfortable so the emphasis is really on learning you know usually your fear consequences don't come true right? Usually if you pet that dog, it's not going to bite you. Usually if you go say hello to a person, they're probably not going to tease you or make fun of you. Usually fear consequences won't come true, but sometimes they do. And the reality, again, the emphasis is always on we're trying to teach people we can cope with it. Whatever happens, you are strong and you can cope with it, right? So like I said, gradual exposure is the core component of CBT. We often help individuals to make a fear hierarchy or a fear ladder or a fear staircase from things they're less afraid of to things they're more afraid of. So for one of my kids who was afraid of thunder and lightning, you know, looking at a picture of thunder and lightning or watching videos was a bit lower on the hierarchy, gradually progressing to actual being outside in thunder and lightning, you know, so we'll often make that kind of fear hierarchy. But again, some kids aren't able to do that. And some kids and some parents aren't able to help us make that fear hierarchy. And that's okay. Um, because we know, again, through, through research that this part isn't necessary. It can help make the process be a bit easier when you can start at a lower level and go to a higher level. But the reality is, again, a lot of individuals with autism can't self-report, I'm at a five or I'm at a four or I'm at an eight right now. And we do know that even if we don't get the hierarchy perfect, you know, even if we were to start at an eight, which, you know, we probably wouldn't, we would, again, be able to cope with that. That is the theme, okay? Um, I'm gonna tr try to wrap this up quickly because I want to get to Q&A. Um, the other thing, um, the other main component 
that's really important is reinforcement, right? It's hard to face your fears, obviously, super hard, the hardest thing in the world, right? So we really, 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 really want to reinforce or reward that brave behavior. With some kids, that mean, might mean with brave bucks or courage cash or um, what have you, that they can earn towards getting activities or prizes or things they want. For other kids, they might need an immediate reward right then. They might need to do the thing that makes them anxious and right away get a lollipop or get their favorite video or get their favorite song or get tickles or a plane ride or whatever it is that's going to be super reinforcing to your child, okay? And the other thing to keep in mind is that we're not holding out for perfection. We want to, not at all. Any attempt is what we want to encourage and reinforce. So maybe your child didn't pet the dog that day. That's okay. Maybe they just stayed in a room with the dog, or maybe they just looked at a dog, or maybe they just looked at a picture of a dog, right? We want to reinforce whatever kind of baby step they took towards being brave or approaching their fears, okay? Um, relaxation is a very, is actually, we did some research recently showing that the most common practice used by therapists to treat anxiety is relaxation. Unfortunately, it's actually not the most helpful component. It doesn't mean there's never a purpose for it, which is why I did add a slide on it. Um, but more recent research has actually shown relaxation itself can become a crutch, where the child is saying, oh, I have to breathe right. I have to do my deep breathing or else I won't feel better. And the reality is no matter how you breathe, whether you do your deep breathing or not, you might feel uncomfortable, your heart may be racing, but again, that's okay. At the end of the day, you can cope with those uncomfortable feelings. So a recent meta-analysis, not meta-analysis actually by White said it all, um, the um, compared treatments, uh, CBT treatments that had relaxation to those that didn't include relaxation. And they actually found that compared to the treatments that didn't have relaxation, the treatments that included relaxation were associated with significantly smaller pre to post treatment effect sizes. So most of the time I actually don't use relaxation or if I do use it, I'll use it not in the context of fear. So if you have a kid who has what we call generalized anxiety and is generally anxious all the time and tense, once a night when you're falling asleep, you know, or one, at one point a day or several times a day, even it might be good to do some deep breathing or some progressive muscle relaxation to generally just help you feel less tense. But I probably wouldn't do relaxation in the moment of facing your fears because um, I wouldn't want to teach the kid they need it. Again, it, it, it all depends. Every child or adult is different. If an individual's anxiety is so great that they can't at all approach the feared situation, then we might help them to do deep breathing or positive imagery or some type of relaxation strategy to help them, again, confront their fears initially. But probably I would want to ultimately fade this out so that, again, they don't feel dependent on any one relaxation strategy to be able to, um, you know, as a crutch to... Um, to be able to face their fears. Because at the end of the day, we really want to send the message that it's just a bad feeling, anxiety is not harmful, and you can tolerate that feeling, okay? The last thing I'll say before I open it up for Q&A, so these are all the treatment components we would do, regardless of whether an individual had autism or not. Everything I just went over is what we would do for anybody. Now, how would it be different for individuals on the spectrum? What would we do differently? The main things we do differently, number one, is we do know that individuals with autism thrive with structure and predictability. So we would do whatever we can to increase the structure and predictability. Um, often that means using concrete and visual teaching strategies, which I'll talk about in the next slide. Um, we use a lot of pictures. I illustrate everything I'm saying with pictures, with social stories, with videos, to really make it as concrete and visual as possible, writing lists of the things we should and shouldn't do, um, crossing out word bubbles of things you should or shouldn't say. I'll, I'll, I'll show you on the next slide, but really trying to make it very, very, very concrete, okay? With some treatments, we might add in extra modules for ASD-specific difficulties. So for example, if you're treating social anxiety, with the average person, you know, if you go up and you confront your fears and you say hello to a person, you know, the reality is they won't reject you. What we do know with a lot of individuals with autism, at least with the social aspects of things, given that autism is a social disorder, we know that um, sometimes if you don't have the social skills, other people might actually reject you. So part of anxiety treatment, at least for social anxiety, might include actually separate um, modules for teaching social skills. 
you know, to help that individual to have a successful experience when they're confronting their fears and texting someone else or calling someone else or going up to someone and saying hello, et cetera. The other differences are there's an increased focus on generalization. Um, we do know that individuals on the spectrum have difficulty with generalizing. Um, so, you know, with a neurotypical child, often they see a therapist alone without a parent present. Um, I would never, I don't do that even for most of my typical kids, neurotypical kids, but certainly for children with autism or even adults with autism, you know, I would want to have other people there to help facilitate generalization into the home or school or residential facility. So when I'm working with kids, you know, I would always have the parents present to be learning whatever skills we're teaching the child, to be watching how I coach the child to face their fears, et cetera, so that the parent can do the same thing and facilitate generalization. And here is what I would say is the biggest difference. Um, and in my opinion, this actually makes children with autism a bit easier to treat their anxiety. I might be the only one who has that opinion, but this is how I view it. Children with autism often have what's called circumscribed interests or restricted interests or special interests. Everybody has intense interests, right? But individuals on the spectrum often have interests that are so intense that they often really, really preoccupy them. And, you know, like I said, we often call those special interests. That might be a special interest in Star Wars or Harry Potter or Star Trek or trains, you know. And instead of trying to fight those special interests or remove them, we try, I, I, as a therapist, you know, would try to capitalize on those special interests. How can we use them to our advantage? Those can be strengths, right? So when treating anxiety, we try to incorporate the child's special interests into treatment. So like I said, if your special interest is Harry Potter, we would really try to talk about fighting Voldemort, being brave like Harry, maybe buying a magic wand to help you cast spells to fight your fears. Um, really trying to convey everything in Harry Potter terms to help increase the buy-in and increase the child's motivation and increase their understanding of what we're doing, right? So whenever possible, and what we know, um, is a child's special interest can really almost act like anti-anxiety stimuli. So the more you can kind of pair the thing they're anxious about with their special interest, it can almost really serve to counteract the anxiety. Okay, and I'll talk more about that in, in the slide after this, but so our specific modifications, two more slides and I'm gonna stop, our specific modifications for cognitive restructuring for individuals on the spectrum are often, you know, depending on their cognitive level, we, would, we might really de-emphasize the cognitive restructuring in the psychoed, or at least modify it to meet their developmental level. Um, like I said, usually I would convey the psychoeducation and cognitive restructuring using visual aids, such as using pictures or lists with pictures like I have here, or modeling, video modeling, um, social stories. So this is a social story I wrote for one child with autism who his anxiety was that he was going to get sick. Every single day, he would come home and ask his mom, who was nine years old, he would, for hours a day, from about the time he came home from school at four till he went to sleep at eight, he would ask his mom, am I going to get sick? Um, am I going to die? You know, am I breathing right? Does my face look red? Does my throat look okay? Does my head feel hot? He would fire rapid questions at his mom about, is he sick, basically? And what do you think his mom did? As any mom would do, as I would do, you know, he, she answered him, right? She would say, no, you're not sick. Um, Yes, your, your throat looks okay. No, your face doesn't look flush. No, you don't have a fever, right? She would answer him. So that answering him was reinforcing him. So he just kept answering those questions, asking those questions because he was dependent on mom to get those answers, right? So it was part of his treatment. treatment. Again, treating anxiety means facing your fears. So for him, facing his fears was having to tolerate those thoughts that my head might be hot or my throat might be red, but not being able to ask his mom and get that reassurance. So we taught his mom to not answer him and not give him reassurance. Now, it doesn't just mean she ignored him when he said, mom, am I sick? But that's why we externalized his anxiety. We taught her to say, I can't answer that because that's a, for him, his anxiety, we named his anxiety, the undertaker, because um, he liked WWF wrestling. So we taught his mom to say, you know, that's just the undertaker. We can't answer that question because um, we have to fight the undertaker. That's an undertaker question. So I can't answer that question. So how did I explain this to this child who had a mild intellectual disability and autism? Because this is a complex thing. We explained it through a social story and he got it. His mom, he understood. He said, wait a minute. So 
to help me fight my anxiety, mom will try not to answer my questions by saying, yes, you're healthy. He said, so it's crossed out. That bubble's crossed out. That means mom can't say that to me. And I said, right, mom can't say that to you. So the crossed out, again, that's what we mean by concrete conveying visually that helped him to really understand what was happening why we were doing this why his mom would no longer be reassuring him instead mom would just say to him that's just your anxiety talking or she would actually say that's the undertaker talking i can't tell you if your throat's red i can't tell you if you have a fever because we have to fight the undertaker right and this is why and at this point we explained habituation to him then like at first that mom when mom says i don't know where i can tell you i'll feel scared after a while, I'll feel less scared. Then after a while longer, I won't be scared anymore. I'll see that my anxiety goes down after a while, even if mom doesn't answer me. Now, this was back um, when we were really focusing on habituation, because this was a child who habituated. For a lot of kids, like I said, I would really be trying to not focus on the habituation piece of things, but more focused on, you know what, your anxiety might not go down, but you can cope with this bad feeling and you can get used to it. And instead, and we ended up also trying to convey that message to this kid, even if your anxiety doesn't go down, what else can you do instead? And you could see on the list of brave behavior things I can do. Instead of asking mama I'm sick, you can listen to music or read a book or go take a walk. We went through all the activities you could do because you can do all those things even if you feel anxious, even if you feel uncomfortable. The last piece of things is how we would modify things for gradual exposure. The biggest thing that I would say is different for kids with autism, like I said, is I really try to incorporate their special interests into the treatment. Now for any person, I would reward them with the thing they like the most after they do an exposure for any kid. But what I'm talking about is more than that. For kids with autism, I'm not just talking about rewarding them after the exposure. I'm, I'm talking about incorporating their special interests into the exposure, or into the treatment itself. So here's a great example. This picture here, my good friend, Dr. Ali Matu, worked with, an in, with a boy with autism whose special interest was Legos. He was obsessed with Legos. And for this child, his fear or phobia was a needle phobia, getting shots and blood tests. So Dr. Matu was able to incorporate this child's special interest in Legos into his needle phobia, into the needle exposure. You can see here in this picture, right? So that's an example of what I mean. Um, I take this one step further with individuals on the spectrum often by pairing anxiety provoking situation with the thing they love the most. Um, and now, like I said, you know, there's some evidence that this can serve as a distraction and make exposure less effective, but certainly for individuals on the spectrum, especially if they're, they're people who are self-injuring or displaying some aggression, I would not just expose the person to the thing they're afraid of and let them just sort of deal with that. <laughs> that might be dangerous. So, so for those kids or adults, I would pair the anxiety provoking situation with their most perseverative special favorite interest. So the example here, Potato Head, I had one child who was so afraid of doctor's offices and doctors. It took six nurses to hold him down. He had seizures, so he had to go to the doctor every week. We, it would have been cruel and, and dangerous to just expose this child to the doctor without anything. So what we did is his favorite thing in the world was Potato Head. So for him, Potato Head, and it was such a special interest that his parents had actually taken away from him two years ago because he was so obsessed with it, he couldn't focus on anything else. So for this child, we brought back Potato Head and we paired the doctor's office with Potato Head so that, you know, we said, okay, you're going to go to the doctor. As soon as you go to the doctor, you're going to get Potato Head. So the very first time he went to the doctor, all he had to do was sit on the examining table and play with Potato Head. No shots, no blood tests, no nothing. Second time, I think the doctor looked in his ears and, um, you know, listened to his heart with a stethoscope while he was holding Potato Head. By the third or fourth time, I think he was getting shots or blood tests even. Um, while holding potato head. Now keep in mind, this was the only time he was allowed to hold potato head was at the doctor's office. So for him, he was so obsessed with potato head, it was like he didn't even notice getting the shot, which was amazing. Um, so for this individual is very, very effective. Um, like I said, this would not be the, where I would start. For most people, I would just have them exposed to the thing without the potato head, if you will, because again, I don't want, ideally, we don't want any crutches. We don't want the individual thinking they can only cope with the doctor because they have potato head. But like I said, for a lot of people on the spectrum, there might be very severe self-injury or aggression. So for those individuals, in my opinion, this is where my clinical opinion, you know, comes into play. It would be irresponsible um, or dangerous to, to just expose the kid to the doctor's office, like I said, and without anything helping to make that anxiety less. 
so eventually we were able to fade out that potato head for that child so that he was going to the doctor without potato head. But certainly I would start with incorporating and pairing their special interests. Um, we would incorporate video modeling or video priming. We might also incorporate functional communication training. So what that means is teaching the child to ask for a break so that if they're at the doctor's office, for example, um, again, individuals in the spectrum often have no power or control over the situation. There's six doctors and nurses holding them down and people are sticking things in their ears and nose and throat. That's cruel, right? Um, so we wanna teach the individual that they have control and power. We wanna teach them to say, I wanna break. I wanna break or break. Or just, if they can't talk, use a break card, right? So that they have control over that situation and can get a break when they need to. Obviously, when you first teach them that, they're gonna be asking for a break 500 times. So gradually over time, we would build up more and more, you know, we would, if the doctor, let's say, is looking in their ears, we would say, okay, um, you know, you asked for a break, um, we're going to look in your ear for one more minute, and then a break, or 30 more seconds, and then a break, and the next time it might be, okay, we're going to look quickly in the next year, and then a break, you might be trying to build up more and more tolerance before you give that break over time, okay, and like I said, the other thing is you would really increase parents or teachers or caretakers' involvement, such as implementing a reward chart for brave behavior. All right. Um, I'm in the interest of time. I'm actually just going to stop here because I do want to leave time for questions and answers. This is just basically talking about the use of visual supports to increase structure and predictability, providing choices. Uh, the last example I'll give of this is again using the doctor's example to give control. Um, which again, we know that a lot of anxiety is about unpredictability and uncontrollability. And to a certain extent, you know, we can't control life, we can't predict life, but we try to give those individual choices where we can. So to use the doctor example again, do you want the doctor to look in your eyes or your ears first? Do you want the doctor to look in the left ear or right ear first? Do you want the doctor to listen to your heart first or, or um, you know, uh, check your eyes? You get what I'm saying. So all of those are um, treatment components, okay? So here's some resources, and I'm going to stop here on the Q&A slide so that we can have our last 20 minutes for questions, okay? All right, Lauren. Well, you have a lot of questions today. So would you like me to read you some questions, or would you like yeah. to go through the Q&A? Uh, sure, however you want. Um, you know, whatever. Oh, yeah, there's a lot. So maybe, I don't know if you want, whatever you, yeah, you can just tell me which ones I, you think, you know, I should start with or answer if you want. Okay. All right. Well, the, there are so many that uh, I'd hate to try to prioritize any over it, any others, but well, yeah. I will I will definitely throw some to you and we can go okay. from there. Okay. Yeah. So my child is primarily nonverbal. He has high anxiety in new settings and needs to elope. He cannot self-control his body and his actions. It leads to a physical fight as we need to help keep him safe. Behavioral strategies like gradual exposure have not worked in the past and he doesn't have a lot of special interests. So if you had a really challenging case like that, have you experienced anything where, you know, where do you start? Yeah, well, I, first of all, I'm not really sure what he's eloping from. So I think that would be he. Um, I'm not sure what he's eloping from, and I'm not sure what he's eloping to. So that would be really important information to know. Um, meaning like, um, cause often again, you know, again, we would want to try to um, have maybe ameliorate in some way what that individual is eloping from. So again, it may not be anxiety. It might be, for instance, I, I don't know specifically, but I'm thinking of a kid where you might give them math assignment in class that's too difficult for them. So every time they, you know, are asked to do it, they elope because it's too challenging for them. Or it could be something anxiety related. I don't know. Um, for one kid with autism I work with, he, his big anxiety was the sound of other kids crying. So there were two girls in particular in class. So whenever they screamed, started screaming or crying, this child with autism would scratch them or hit them and then elope from the room. And all the teachers would chase him down um, the hall and event and usually, and then they would take him to the break room. So what did this child learn? He learns a pretty good way to get away from something that makes me anxious is I is I scratch and hit them, run out of the room, and then they get to take me to a break room, right? So that makes sense why um, that would be happening, right? Uh, so for this child in particular, we did do gradual exposure to the sound of crying. And again, perhaps with this particular case, maybe they weren't starting slow enough or mild enough for this kid. We started with just audio recordings of kids crying at a very low volume. 
and gradually increasing it to higher volumes before we even got to videos of these particular children in his class crying who were triggers. And what we also taught this child to do, like I said, is we taught him to ask for a break. He was minimally verbal. Um, so we gave him break cards. And the very first time I basically sat in the office with him and I played a recording of a, a child crying in a very low volume. And I immediately took his hand physically prompted him to put it on the break card, hand me the break card. And I said, oh, you want a break? And I turned off the crying right away, right? Um, so he learned pretty quickly, okay, when I want a break, I just hand this break card instead of hitting or aggressing and then running out of the room. And then I get a break. So, and we had to prompt him obviously in class. Then when it came to the kids actually crying, his teachers would very, or his aide would very quickly prompt him to say, use your break card or put his hand on the break card. And so then he started doing it independently, giving him a break card when he would want a break from class. Um, so obviously that, that fixed the eloping and running out of the classroom, the aggression gradually over time, we cut down on the number of break cards so that he was, um, being increasingly exposed to, again, these things that were anxiety provoking for him. And in, in sessions, again, we would also increase the volume of the crying, like I said, so that we're increasingly exposing him to things that made him anxious and while reducing the number of break cards and or duration of the breaks so that he was getting increasing exposure to gradual break. And we did this without incorporating special interests. Uh, I'm getting so many questions, so I, I want to try sure. to tackle sort of in general themes. Um, one theme that's come through several times is about transitions, where the, the actual anxiety is created by just transition, not sure. so much by a specific transition, but just any time there's going to be one. So do you have Absolutely. You seen that? Absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, this is something I should say too. So the research shows about 50% of the time when people on the spectrum are anxious, it's the same anxiety as neurotypical ha people have, but about 50% of the time, about half the time, it's very different anxiety, um, different content, right? And one of the most common things there is transitions. That's something that um, neurotypical people, you know, might struggle with transitions, but not nearly to the extent that kids on the spectrum do for sure. So, um, this is, you know, one of the things we do to help, again, individuals with transitions is we make it as predictable as possible. And there's many ways we can do that. We use visual schedules, right, to show them what's going to happen next. Like, I have a calendar here. This is actually me. This was what I made for my daughter when she was three years old. She's seven now. Um, for Because she had a different caretaker every day of the week. You know, my mom would come one day, my mother-in-law another day. So th that transition alone was challenging for her. So we had a calendar where we would put at the top of the calendar who was watching her that day. So she knew who was going to be with her again, as a way to help make it more predictable for other kids. Um, we use so, um, advanced warnings, timers and countdowns to make that transition more gradual. So let's say, and again, to use my daughter as a great example, she has a lot of trouble transitioning and let's say from dinner to the bath. So we might say, okay, look, we met at the time timer, this thing where, and the time timer is really nice because even if you can't tell time, you see the red running out of it. I have a lot of time timers. So you see the red running out. Okay, you have five more minutes until we have to stop eating dinner and then go in the bath. And then as we're getting close to the zero, I would probably also give a countdown. Okay, we got 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Dinner over, time for the bath. Um, and so for some... There's some kids who the timers and transitions make them, the timers and countdowns make them more anxious. But for the vast majority of people on the spectrum, timers and countdowns are very helpful in terms of providing an advance warning of what's going to come, either when a preferred activity is going to end or a non preferred act, how much longer they have left to do a non preferred activity, et cetera. Um, for some kids, an hourglass timer is the most effective. For some kids, this time tracker here is more effective, where it goes from green to yellow to red when their time is up. For other kids, it's the time timer. When you see the red running out, you might have to experiment with your kid, but almost always some type of advanced warning almost always helps with the transition. And the other big thing we do to help with the transitions, again, another way to make it more predictable, I write social stories about it to prepare them for what's going to happen. But the other thing we do is priming, which, um, which means previewing future events under more relaxed circumstances. Um, sometimes we do live priming. So for a child who had, let's say, a huge phobia of car washes, uh, random, I know, and like, why would he need to even go to car washes? But let's put that aside. So for him, priming was like actually pretending to wash cars at home and doing previewing of that. But for a lot of kids, we would do video priming. So that means, so a bird's eye view, this is different than video modeling. With video modeling, it's a video of a person modeling the thing, okay? Um, 
but with video priming, it's a bird's eye view of what it would look like for the person who's anxious. So let's say a big common anxiety that kids have is transitioning from class to class, especially when they get to middle school and they often have to transition from one classroom to another, or even in elementary school. I've had kids who have massive anxiety when they have to transition from one classroom to the art room or one classroom to lunchtime. So for those kids, we might take a video, again, of the transition, a bird's eye view as a, a camera, moving from the classroom to the cafeteria and the kid would watch that at home over and over and over again. That's a form of gradual exposure, right? But we could also conceptualize that as priming or just previewing what's going to happen under more relaxed circumstances to help you be able to cope with that transition. Does that make sense? Um, so those are some of the most common things we would do. Now, of course, everything in life can't be predictable. We had one kid who would get anxious, really upset whenever it would rain, you know, um, and, and something would be canceled, which would be canceled. You obviously can't always predict when it's going to rain, even with the weather. So to a certain extent, once you start doing all these things, you want to build in a up and we don't know what's going to happen at this hour on the schedule. You want to start to very slowly build in some unpredictability over time, but certainly the initial stages to help with transitioning which is such of, if not the most common fear and anxiety, one of the main things you're doing is all of these different methods of increasing predictability, right? With visual schedules and calendars and social stories and even just first then cards. They don't have a picture of that, but first you do this, then you do this. It's just a way of helping kids know what is going to happen, okay? All right, well, a lot there. And I think what you're saying is that these same strategies, regardless of what the issue is, you're going to use these same core strategies. So oh, there isn't a special yeah. strategy. I mean, but what about, so I did get some questions about food and, and mm -hmm. essential sure. things. So if you've got someone who is, has anxiety around eating or, mm -hmm. or swallowing, um, have you seen specific strategies about that? Or are there specialists who people need to talk to when they engage yeah. in those situations? Yeah, I mean, you might you, you might be working with a BCBA, you might be working some speech and language th pathologist specialized in feeding issues. You want to make sure there's not a feeding or swallowing issue, of course. Um, but so it, assuming there's not, and it's, you know, completely fear, anxiety-based fear of, and that's very common, again, in kids with autism, sensory sensitivities, they have fears of foods with certain textures or certain colors. I've had kids will only eat one color food, like only orange foods, or kids will only eat food of a certain texture. Um, so again, the strategy is the same. You're doing exposure, right? So you're pairing it. And, and again, it can be really challenging. I had one child with autism who would only eat McDonald's pancakes, right? So every day his parents had to go out and get McDonald's pancakes. If they even tried to get like a Lego Eggo pancake from the grocery store and put it in a McDonald's bag to trick him, he would throw it up, right? So again, the strategy is exposure. And where you start is going to be different for every kid. Um, for some kids, you know, you're gonna start it, okay, for, for this kid, we were able to say, just take one bite of this Lego pancake or whatever, and then you could get your McDonald's pancake. And after a few hours of him saying, you know, no, I'm not, you know, he couldn't really talk, but he was saying, um, basically no eating crying and no, he didn't want the Lego pancake, but eventually he was hungry and he did want his, his McDonald's pancake. So eventually he took a bite of, of the Lego pancake. And then he got his McDonald's pancake. And in a few days, we were able to build it up to two bites of the Lego pancake. In a few days, three bites of the Lego pancake. And Lego, Lego, whatever it's called, pancake. And then eventually we were able to start with a new food. So we moved very slowly. We reinforced him with the Lego pancake, uh, with the McDonald's pancake, I'm sorry. Um, for other kids, we might have to start even just touching the food, right? Even just touching the new food would be their exposure and then get rewarded or just looking at it. Um, for some kids, we might want to even just make a game out of it, playing with it if they have certain sensory sensitivities. I'm thinking of a kid I work with who is really afraid of anything creamy, not just eating, but anything creamy, like shampoo, conditioner, um, toothpaste. So he was 10 years old and he never brushed his teeth with toothpaste. He only used water. So for that kid, we didn't even start at like eating something creamy or or or, or um, you know, brushing his teeth. We, we started with like, he was scared of even just like bottles of toothpaste or, or, you know, tubes of toothpaste or bottles of conditioner. So we even started with just having him look at pictures online of toothpaste bottles, of you know, tubes of toothpaste and bottles of conditioner. 
eventually we, I remember we played checkers with bottles of toothpaste. We played like games with the, or bowling. Oh no, that was, that was, video. we played bowling like as a way to make it fun. And again, incorporate a special interest in game in there. We played bowling with all these bottles of conditioner and shampoo and creamy things. Eventually we were able to like squirt it on the table. Um, eventually we worked our way up to him brushing my teeth. I remember the first time he brushed my teeth with toothpaste, he threw up. He was so grossed out by it, right? And eventually, again, after many, many months, we we worked his way to brushing up his teeth with toothpaste or putting conditioner on his hair. So I don't mean to make this sound easy. I still struggled with my, my own seven-year-old has always had food tolerances, um, food intolerances, almost as bad, almost as severe as many of the kids with autism I've worked with. She has a very limited range of eating. My two-year-old eats literally anything in the world, but my seven-year-old um, doesn't. She's a really picky eater even now. But we've worked really hard over the years of exposing her to new foods one at a time and giving her a lot of rewards for doing so. And it's challenging for her. You know, she used to gag on everything and um, it's, it's, it's a lot better now. But we'll even say, like, do you just take one bite of this? And we do know it takes like it could take 10 to 20 exposures of of a food before even a person gets used to it. So you wouldn't want to stop after the first. But I think we get in this habit, especially when there's gagging and throwing up. I remember when she was little, I would give her something, she would gag, and I'd be like, okay, you don't have to have it anymore. Especially, we all hate throw up so much that we're like, if a kid gags or throws up, you're like, okay, that's it, we're done. But that just reinforces and teaches the kid, okay, I don't, that's what I do the next time I have this, I gag or throw up. So it's so painful, but you have to plow through after they gag and say, okay, you know, I know you gagged, that was off. I just want you to try one more bite of this or even one taste of this. Just put on your tongue even, or um, something like that, a mini meal, or, or, you know, we'll say like a teeny little bitty, like a pea, again, something super small or even half a pea. And then you get your favorite thing, or we could do that while playing a song or singing a song, a way to incorporate their special interests into that. And then, um, like I said, after they do. So again, the procedure is the same. Um, it's exposure, you know, no matter what it is, fear of food, fear of sounds, fear of anything, it, it's exposure. Um, but again, it, it can be in a very, very, very gradual fashion and trying to incorporate games and fun things and special interests into it however you can to make it more tolerable. All right, we're almost out of time. So I've got, again, there's so many questions, so I'm sorry we can't get to more of them. But I think one question that came up several times that might be helpful to a lot of people is if you need this type of support for your, for your loved one on the spectrum, or if you're on the spectrum and you need this sort of therapy, if you, if you think that CBT or these different interventions would be helpful, how do you identify and find a provider who does that, particularly somebody who works with people on the spectrum? That is a good question. Um, I don't have a great answer for that, um, honestly, because there there's... I would say, you know, a lot of BCBAs, behavior analysts are, are, are well-versed. Certainly they're well-versed in all this predictability stuff we just talked about and in, and in reinforcement for, for, um, for, for, for challenging tasks. They might not as be well-versed in the cognitive end of things, the CBT end of things. And then on the flip side, you have a lot of CBT providers who, who are experts in treating anxiety, but not necessarily, you know, might not know the different modifications you would use that I discussed for kids on the spectrum. So what I would say is I, I would probably try both. I mean, it might take a lot of experiment to even under the best of circumstances, God, even any of my adult or typical friends who are finding a therapist, sometimes they have to try five or 10 different ones before they find one who clicks. So it's always, it's not always easy to find help. Um, just like with anything, I guess. Or, um, but I would try, I would try looking up cognitive behavioral therapists. You know, asking when you're, you know, calling people who take your insurance or googling people in the area, cognitive behavioral therapy, anxiety. Um, and when you talk to those people, ask them if they're comfortable working with people on the spectrum. And if they're not, you know, I'm, I'm always happy to consult with those people and give them some tips. Or you can even send them these slides with some of the strategies. Because again, I think sometimes a typical CBT providers who don't typically work with kids on the spectrum might be a bit reticent. But, you know, I, I usually try to send them the message that you're doing the same stuff. It really is exactly the same stuff. There's just these um, modifications you would make. Like we said, incorporating the parents and trying to really incorporate the special interests, et cetera. Um, so I'd be happy to do that, but I think probably trying to find a CBT provider who specializes in CBT for anxiety is a good way to go. And, you know, if that's not successful, and also I would also in tandem work with BCBAs, um, or, or behavior analysts 
Um, if, if they don't, there are some behaviorists who, again, like I said, don't believe in the notion of anxiety, who might say there's no such thing as anxiety. So that might not be a good person to treat anxiety in that situation. But there are a lot of behaviorists, I think, who very much would endorse that this child's afraid or anxious and be able to do a lot of the strategies we discussed today. And like I said, I would direct those providers towards my slides, towards this webinar, and they can watch it themselves and, and hopefully learn some of the modifications that they would use. But also feel free to contact me. And if I know of anyone in the particular area where you live who specializes in this, I can direct you towards the, those people. Okay, great. Well, Lauren, we are out of time. So thank you for answering all those questions. I did want to let everyone know, uh, if you look in the chat, um, there are links to the handouts and also to the quiz, which will be available in just a couple more minutes. So don't click that link yet because uh, we're still finalizing the quiz. But we also included those links in your reminder email today. So we are updating that page right now and should have that up in a few minutes. And Lauren, thank you so much. And I see Steve's back. Yeah, thank you, Lauren. And you did a super job as always. And um, I hope we'll continue to work together in the future. And I'm sure that's going to be the case. And um, yeah, a wonderful job. Anxiety is a huge issue in the field. Um, estimates up to 80% of those on the spectrum suffer uh, from anxiety. So um, it, a lot of people need guidance and help. And I'm sure yeah. uh, your words of wisdom will be helping quite a few people out there. Can I say one more thing before we go? No. Is that okay? Oh, no. Okay. Ahead, sure. I just saw this person. I feel so bad I didn't get to all the questions. I'm so sorry. But I see here it said, doesn't cognitive restructuring assume the logical part of the brain? Um, it seems my adult son can agree to apply this challenge your feelings behavior when needed, but not when he's actually anxious. I just want to really quickly say something about that. You totally have to practice these things, like I said, in more contrived scenarios before you get to the real scenario. It's just like if you were doing a piano recital. You have to practice it a lot in at home and in dress rehearsals and try to maybe simulate what the real situation would be like as much as possible before you get into that real situation. And so we try to, as much as we can, simulate it. That's what I would say. And then do it in the real situation. So like the kid who was, you know, eloping in class with the other kids crying, for sure, you don't, that's not where you're originally going to teach it. You're going to teach it in your office, in a controlled setting, listening to sounds of crying. But when you eventually bring it into the real classroom, yes, you're going to need to at first prompt that child to use their break card. They're not just going to do it right away on their own. You're going to need a lot of practice and prompting and rehearsal in the real life situation before the kids start doing those things on their own. I just wanted to emphasize that point. Okay. Well, great, great, great answer. Okay. Well, thanks again, Warren. We'll keep in touch sure. in many ways. Okay. And Thanks, and thank Steve. everyone. And then uh, next quarter, um, we'll put, put together another um, co-sponsored webinar between the Autism Research Institute and the World Autism Organization. So uh, thank you for your attention and stay healthy. Goodbye. Thanks so much, Steve. Thanks, Denise. Bye. Thanks, Petra.